Our last panellist for this session, uh, Paul uh, Schulter, uh, somebody who has uh, a lot of experience, uh, both uh, in, the, in the academic realm, but also working in government and for uh, international institutions in uh, considering some of these, uh, these issues to do with... Uh, to do with nuclear deterrence and beyond, and uh, worked as, also as a, as a weapons inspector for the uh, United Nations. Uh, currently, um, his uh, current posts in, include honorary professor at the Institute for Conflict, Cooperation and Security at Birmingham University, and he's a non-resident senior associate at the Carnegie Endowment. Paul. Thank you very much. I'm uh, pleased and, uh, I guess, anthropologically intrigued to be here. I always enjoy these events because of the the, um, the flows of opinion and attitude that, as well as the strategic analysis which occur in them. I'm going to talk about uh, um, underwater drones, UUVs, um, uh, and I'm not going to talk as a techie. I have O-level physics. <laughs> um, but I will um, look into the uh, considerable amount of strategic analysis. Um, various points, some of which have been made. Um, first of all, this isn't new. The idea of um, technologies to, sh to shadow and compromise um, SSBNs has been considered for 40 or 50 years. There is a very large and necessarily confidential accumulation of research materials um, in, in a number of countries, notably the, the US and Russia on, on this. And, and that su doesn't suddenly be become invalidated um, unless there's an extraordinary breakthrough. Uh, the, the then there's fundamental physics, because the sea is really, really large. It's not as really, really large as space in the Hitchhiker's Galaxy, but it is very big. Um, and it's reassuringly opaque, and it's absorptive. And some of those basic physical parameters are, are not going to change, uh, 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 unless there is, as I say, this uh, extraordinary breakthrough, which has not reliably happened, but keeps being talked about. Um, and secondly, if to the extent there are new scientific <coughs> developments, there will be new technological ones, and those will involve countermeasures. So if we're worried about the idea of um, uh, a tracking, uh, the, the idea is summed up in that basic document I, I was Googling for coming here, the inescapable net. Um, what, what a, what a doom-ridden phrase there. But the inescapable net will be confronted with um, net-piercing technologies like spoofing, like jamming, like uh, launchable decoys, like uh, enhanced detection arrangement and destruction arrangements for UUVs. So the technology isn't going to flow all one way. Then there's geography and law. Uh, there are territorial seas, uh, the 12-mile limit. In those uh, limits. To the extent you were worried about penetrating sneaky UUVs hanging around to track your SSBNs as they exited the port, you would be entitled in peacetime to make a huge stir about them. This is an infringement of national sovereignty. And in a plausible nuclear crisis, just to destroy them, um, it would be an evident threat to national uh, security. So the idea of these things, and in the Cold War analogy I think was lice. You, SSVNs would try and shake off, they would de-louse. They would be followed by uh, rushing tracking, Russian uh, uh, tracking submarines, and they would shake them off at the beginning of the patrol. So the de-lousing possibilities I think remain quite strong. And as you reach the, the end of the territorial sea, where this becomes more difficult, of course, the spatial problems are much more difficult for any, any um, tracking devices to, to pick up. Um, then there's arms control, which we've been, has been talked about. There, there was this idea, if this became a really, really serious problem, um, there, there was an idea which the Russians were quite interested in, or the Soviets were interested in the Cold War, anti-submarine warfare bastions, that you could declare and then uh, create technologically areas of sea where there would be uh, no ASW going on in order to preserve strategic superiority. Now, um, th that idea hasn't been around for a while. Um, it hasn't needed to be. But I remind you that that would be one stabilizing option to maintain nuclear deterrence, um, which unfortunately is widely believed by the people who actually take the decisions uh, in, in this area to, to be a strong and continually relevant um, 
concept. So that's a possibility, and the Russians indeed may want it most. If we're worried about Russia as the, the only pl plausible um, candidate for launching these difficult, expensive UEVs, I'll talk about a bit more, it's going to be Russia, and they may want uh, security for um, SSBNs more than anybody else. So um, there's a kind of an asymmetry of interest there. And then operationally, the SSBNs are out in the open sea, um, and what's the risk of their being uh, tracked by um, these putative UUVs? I mean, even Nick agrees that's not very high. Um, the successor class will be very, very quiet. That's one of the reasons it will be so very, very expensive. Um, and when in the open ocean, it will be able to jink around. Um, SSBN captain, boomer captains, as they're called, have this kind of le legendary um, respect within navies for being um, uh, subtle, being able to, to, to explore the possibilities of thermoclines, which m mess up detection arrangements, to drop down to, to um, valleys in un underwater ocean ranges, to go silent suddenly, to maneuver around sh shadowing vessels. All that isn't going to go away. And British submarines will be operating in the Atlantic, which is a noisier, an environment with rather greater background noise than the Pacific. So their problem in avoiding detection is going to be rather easier than those navies uh, that have to operate in the Pacific, no notably the US, the Chinese, and others. So we can expect the Americans to be spending a great, continuing to spend a great deal of money on this problem, and we could to the extent that it becomes a serious problem, which hasn't yet been established, um, we could expect to acquire some of their technologies um, reasonably cheaply without having to do the cutting edge research ourselves. Um, SSBNs also will be fast uh, with a near limitless range provided by their le length and uh, nuclear reactor. Now, it's very unlikely that UUVs will be able to match either, either speed or range. Uh, the only way they could begin to do that, given the uh, constraints of naval architecture, is if they were nuclear powered themselves. And uh, is it very likely that there are going to be autonomous nuclear powered hunter killer uh, UUVs roaming the ocean? It's, that's, if, if a navy like Russia's or anybody else's starts getting into that game, then that's an expensive investment. It stretches them in other directions. And um, it, it it creates um, a, a set of vulnerabilities I'll talk about, amongst them political. Um, this, is, this would be a highly unpopular move. Um, in a crisis then, um, how much difference is this going to make? Um, are enemy UUVs, putatively enemy UUVs, really going to be um, effectively following, shadowing SSBNs? Could they be reliably controlled? Uh, underwater communications are very difficult. Could they be instructed to preempt our SSBNs at exactly the right moment when it was clear there was going to be a war, it was clear there was going to be a launch, but not before, because an attack on an SSBN is, is a major act of nuclear aggression. It would, from, from an alliance point of view, be the destruction of a major strategic nuclear asset. Now, doing that is going to have repercussions, not, not just from us, but but more widely. Is it plausible that all the American fleet and the, well, the one or two uh, French SSBNs are going to be preempted in the same moment? And if we have two boats at sea, is it plausible that both of those certainly will be eliminated? There's, there's a high risk here for anyone contemplating this, that um, uh, this precipitates the, the nuclear retaliation that, that it's in, intended to preempt. So, uh, and in Further, the, the way that these putative nuclear autonomous UUAVs are operating is going to be an indicator in itself. It's going to be a, a very serious warning indicator that the crisis is approaching um, a, a launch level. So it, this is a daunting prospect for anybody thinking of trying to invest in and operate and then activate uh, a fleet, and it would have to be a fleet of expensive autonomous nu nuclear U UAVs. So in, 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 Sh in Thomas Schelling's terms, the threat that leaves something to chance is certainly going to be in place. It, it will not be possible, prospectively, to remove that threat. 
Um, so that's the strategic analysis. And now the anthropology and the wider political um, uh, reflection on this kind of discussion. Uh, we're talking about a field of knowledge in all these uh, um, areas about uh, an offense-defense race which is invisible. Um, it's a mystery, actually, I think, for most of these things. Uh, less of a mystery in the UUV area than perhaps more in the cyber area, but just exactly what the balance is. Nobody knows it until it can be tried. Um, and then it, it changes every week, so um, it, it will never be reliably established. And um, we need to understand that that's, that's the balance, that's how it is. It's not that mean old governments are keeping uh, evidence which could and should be revealed to the public secret. Some of this can't be revealed, and the balance is actually mysterious. But the way this is talked about, I'm fascinated, uh, I, because I, I periodically see things from Russia today. This is also a field of information warfare. Uh, the Russians have been very good at reporting basic and other reports on this. Uh, it, it's out there, and anyone who, you know, who re reads Sputnik or Russia Today, every one of these speculations is echoed around because that's what information warfare in the 21st century does. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in the, in the receptivity of the audience here and beyond in the wider world um, because when Nick said, uh, I th we, we may be convened here because a number of us are worried about the way that these technologies could undermine the SSPNs and the idea of the dragons and uh, the vanguards, etc. I wonder if that's true. If we do the thought experiment here, looking round, I suspect that a substantial amount, number of the audience would actually be rather pleased if they heard that the reasonable conclusion here was that uh, the successor system should not be paid for. Maybe I'm wrong, but let's see if the subsequent discussion reveals that. Paul, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, rounding up uh, the panel discussion and uh, some very interesting and thought-provoking contributions uh, that meld together. Uh, we now have pretty much um, an hour for, uh, for open discussion, which is... Uh, where we'll go to next, um, and I invite you all to, uh, to eagerly make uh, contributions, observations, and questions. What I would say is, although a lot of you uh, know each other, when you do uh, uh, make your contribution, when I recognize you, could you identify yourself uh, for, uh, for the rest of the audience and for the panelists? And also, if you have a particular point and a particular issue that you want to raise with a particular panelist, you know, direct it as, uh, as much as possible. So, uh, with that, let's get into questions. And first of all, the, the gentleman in the second row. Okay. Uh, my name is Paul Hall. I'm a 